<laughs> I'll tell you what, this uh, video thing is just driving me crazy. I uh, shot a 22-minute video on this uh, more jig bore here, and I don't have the memory to do it anymore. Uh, the computer is dying down. So I could be down to about 12 minute video. So I'll split this video into two uh, pieces. And I have to tell you, I, I think I explained in the video that uh, I paid a guy a couple thousand dollars or more to um, show me how to use this. Uh, he came into my business and I paid him to do that. And I caused a little bit of a stir. But uh, without any support to this channel, or more substantial, I'm not going to do any more more jig bore videos whatsoever. And I fulfilled all my promises I made to anybody on this jig bore, and I will make no further promises. So maybe in the future there'll be some jig bore videos, but not for the foreseeable future. Like I say, i got to have support for this channel to get into a, 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 a subject that nobody but a very few people are interested in. I was interested in it because I needed to financially. If you are interested into it, pony up financially, okay? But I'm going to concentrate more on tool making, cutting tools over on the cutter grinder from now on. Okay. dialed in here. Okay. Now, these little Noga arms work pretty good on the jig bore, I found. And I will set that in a safe place there. I've got the vise dialed in, and I, I stuck a uh, one, two, three block in there, and first squared it up with a square, then used the lead hammer with the dial indicator took just a couple of taps, so that can go pretty quick. Now, I got a just simple job to do here, uh, drill some holes in these two uh, aluminum pieces for a mount for a flicker finger on a <laughs> hair and gear spindle. Always something here. And uh, I thought I'd show you a few things about this jig bore, and it's good that I use, use it a little bit. Now, one of the things that was pointed out to me by Moore itself, a technician at Moore, is it's got um, a double um, variable sheave Reeves drive with two uh, special belts. It's a compound. Uh, type drive. And those belts, uh, like all rubber belts, will kind of get a memory in them. So it's really good if you're going to not use the machine for a while to put it in uh, new, uh, what would I say, middle speed. And that keeps the uh, better than low or high, it keeps those belts on the middle of those pulleys so they don't kink. And that way, when you start the machine up, it, it won't have the, the, as bad of a belt set and it won't take as long for the machine to smooth out for the belts to warm up. So I, I left the machine probably about 1200 well, it's time to kick it on here, make sure there's, <laughs> I took that indicator out of there. There we are, 1125. I don't know how loud this machine's going to be, so uh, I'll talk right into uh, the camera microphones here. Now, what you want to do, and it says so right on the hard inch chucker, and I assume on the HLVH, is to run the variable speed pulley. Uh, throughout its range uh, often and that way it lubricates the shaft and the pulleys don't sit in one spot 
and vibrate out the lubrication and wear themselves out. I hope that makes sense. So, when you first use the machine, it's good to run it from high to low. Um, those pulleys, and I'll do that right now. We're at mid speed, I'm gonna go all the way to low. Now, this jig board is from Hanford and it was set up special by Moore. It doesn't have a two-speed motor. It has a single-speed three-horse motor. It's got more oomph. And all they were using it for is fly cutting. Okay? So, uh, I don't need that lower speed because they use carbide and mostly I'm machining on um, cast iron or aluminum. Okay, so I don't need to go so slow. So, that's low and it will go up to high and it's got an electric motor up there a little Bodine motor gear motor that changes those pulleys it takes a while for that tack to catch up and that's of course an aftermarket uh, digital tack Okay, there it is. So as fast as this one will go is 2,668 RPMs. Gonna run it back down. And I'm gonna run it uh, probably to the top one more time, then uh, get it back to uh, medium speed. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that click, but that was the switch for the little gear motor. Boston gear motor. What those are. Now for you uh, rivet lathe fans, the uh, variable speed sheave were built by the same company that uh, made them for the 1020s. Tool room lathe. Yeah, picked up a little more. See the belts kind of heat up. Okay, I'm gonna pull it down to uh, medium speed here. Right about the middle, that's good. Oh, a little faster. Yeah. Okay, now, this uh, machine, instead of having a knee like a bridge port, it's got these ways here and the spider wheel, a chain and a counterweight. The, the head does not power feed on these ways. These are only for location. However, they did use these on uh, retrofit CNC um, jig boards. It would be nice if they did. And it's only got five inches of quill travel just like the uh, miserable bridge port. <laughs> okay, so it's got a spindle housing here. Here's the power feed. Power feed selection here. Now, I made a change to this machine and that's why it has a digital tack. One of the reasons it didn't have a tack at all is uh, on these older machines, the finest feed is uh, one and a half thousandths. And to meet the criteria such as outlined by Kenamel for the Lomicron head, uh, you're supposed to have a feed of less than one thousandths. So I did a compound pulley up there and I got it to uh, 0.8 thousandths. Three thousandths is point one six. See, I dropped everything about half. Clever, huh? <laughs> well, that's how I updated this machine to that specifications of the number three jig board. 
everything is pretty close to the same here's the brake here as the number three now the spindle tooling it has a special thread and I'm going to set the camera right here and you're going to have to look back and uh, I got a special wrench and it fits right up here and you put on the brake and you can pull these loose quick change <laughs> So they screw in. The machine has no reverse because of that. Okay? That's important. You can see that very coarse square thread pulls this up into that spindle. The spindle has to be extremely clean when you install these. And it's best to put a little drop of oil on here and smear it on. Just smear it around a little bit. And you gotta be sure not to screw a cold shank into a warm spindle because it could stick and you may not be able to get it out. Okay, so when you put a when you put the tool in the spindle. And there's another thing uh, Ron in Texas was asking about. Now on the earlier machines, they would tell you to test the spindle contact. And I'll do that right here. I think it's still good with uh, Prussian blue. I got some Permatex Prussian blue. And that's a blue dye that does not dry, okay? It's like grease. So I'm going to put a bunch on here, okay? That I'm going to overdo it so you can see it, okay? See it on the camera. I'll probably get it a lot thinner. You know, you want to get it about as thin on there as you can, and it's pretty thick. So I got, I got that on there. I'm going to find a rag before I scratch my blue nose. Okay, now I'm going to put this up into the spindle and feel the thread catch. Okay, the spindle's cool, the shank is cool. I'm going to put the wrench in there and put the brake on and put my hand up very close here and just snug it just not even as tight as a spark plug okay just so it's not going to fall out spin itself out when you put the brake on okay so that's up in there now i will remove it and we'll check the contact. Okay, this, the way the GoPro works, it chapters the videos. And so it cut it off after 11 minutes and 48 seconds. And I believe there's like 11 and a half minutes to go in the next video. Okay.